So we are gathered around again. I'm with Sean and Jason. We're going to try to get through Matthew chapter 6, and hopefully we'll do it in uh, under an hour and a half this time. (laughs) But uh, good conversations on the last chapter. Yes, absolutely. um, Who would like to open in prayer? Uh, I will. Will you, Sean? Okay. Dear Father, thank you once again for the opportunity for us to gather together and to learn about you, learn from your word, your living word, and to uh, share in the positive information that we gain together as a singular unit. We are brothers in Christ and we look to learn as much as we can about you so that we can help ourselves and help each other and help others around us share in the glory that is your word. Thank you so much for having mercy on us and providing us the opportunity to become one with your powerful living word. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. 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 All right, I will read chapter 6. So, take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they will be praised by people. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Mm -hmm. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your charitable giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they will be seen by people. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I'm going to pause there. Let's discuss that. That's some... to verse 8 there, verses 1 through 8. Uh, I'm just going to, I'll start and say that uh, I, I usually use a, a New King James, or and, and I'll sometimes use an NIV if I'm trying to like do a Bible study in the past with, with another person who may not be able to you know follow along with the KJV or the NKJV. And one of the things, one of the differences that I noticed, it's just an addition that uh, it says uh, at the end of verse 4 and also verse 6 that uh, when your father sees what is done in secret, he will reward you openly. It's, ah. And uh, I, I like that, that, you know, elaboration on, you know, it kind of brings the, the, the secret, like praying in secret, full circle as to, you know, encompassing you know, the spiritual and the physical, whereas, you know, you don't go out there and uh, flaunt your 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 divine blessings or like your, your divine presence, your interaction with God, and make yourself look like you're you're such a godly person, and because that can turn people away from uh, the possibility of their salvation. I think because it just I mean you're being like openly prideful about something that you know uh, is doesn't doesn't want you to have pride. Right. I mean, it's good to have, I mean, be proud in your faith, I guess, if you, you know, the right definition, but, you know, he will, he will reward you openly, and that will be kind of, you know, the outward uh, appearance of your blessings without you having to say it. Like, it, it'll be evident to others through his, his blessings, not from me, what your own words say. Reminds so. me of the proverb that says, don't, call yourself wise but uh-huh. let other people yes. refer to you as wise right. you know a wise man will have 
other people ad- talking about him and yeah. saying, yeah, that guy's got wisdom. But if we're out there right. telling everybody, yeah, I'm pretty wise, <laughs> which I'll tell you, I have been guilty of. Uh, but but so I'm, it's very, it's kind of scary to think about that. <laughs> Because, you know, you get to be confident in, in learning and having a lot of revelation. And it's not like you're trying to um, be boastful. boastful about it. Right. But you're just yeah. sort of like, hey, you really should listen to me. I've got a few years of experience in this. I guess there might be a, some instances where that could be okay. Fool, yeah. You're talking to and somebody. And thick headed. And you might need to emphasize, you know, you mm-hmm. need to listen. Right, like yeah. like Paul does that uh-huh. in uh, Corinthians, does he not? Yeah. With this, when he's referring yeah. to himself as one of the apostles, and he's comparing himself to the super apostles, and he's like, "Yeah, I I have nothing in comparison to these super apostles. I was just beaten all these different times, shipwrecked <laughs> for my faith, starving, giving up all everything I have, you know." And he's clearly. Um, making a joke he's being yeah. sarcastic and boasting a little bit about him. and and he does that again in um i th- oh god what is it is it philippians where he says that um that he was a pharisee of pharisees he studied under uh-huh. gamaliel and was uh, a hebrew of hebrews and uh he was concerning the law blameless and persecuting the church with zeal and, and you know what i mean so Basically, he admitting that he was like the worst of the worst essentially um, well he's listing his qualifications yeah. though actually oh, okay. i think he's like basically saying i am qualified to talk on this yeah. subject of the legitimacy of christ because i used to be fully in the other camp and providing right. evidence for it too which is right which is not if, if it's truth truth based it's not really like embellishing you know it's not like uh uh, dishonestly, you know, c- making yourself uh, look better than you really right. are. You know what I'm saying? It is. It's a factual thing. It's a, so I think it was more like it's it's acceptable in the right manner and on a more like personal level, like you between you and another person that you're talking to, right. if it's required. But like, don't go out like like I said on the street corner and, and pray openly, you know, or like you know, flaunt your flaunt your div- divine relationship openly to everybody you know that's so i like that you know it makes it you know it shows the the real personal relationship between god and uh, a follower of his you know because it's i don't know i I like that from that video we watched with the handshakes you know the the personal commitment and and promise and relationship that god carries with one person but you know that person is representing an entire people as well so do you have something you wanted to um, add on that, Jason? We uh, we're fortunate that we live in a generation that's not going to be very impressed with you if you stand out on the street corner and pray. But uh, I guess uh, in another generation, that might make you really somebody in the eyes of the community. But uh, I think they would probably think you were pretty flaky. Yeah. If you did that. Honestly, anyway. like I, I feel like. <laughs> people would avoid you uh, nowadays at least or in other countries where you know people are persecuted for their faith like you would you know be susceptible to like the mob you know, that we talked about in our last one you know right. it's just being careful like pride pride comes before fall so like you know if you're going to go out there and be like extremely prideful about your divine relationship like that that could backfire on you depending on where you oh, are yeah, in the it world will. it, it will it certainly yeah. will with pride Maybe not that first time but if pride eventually. is the center of it i think you know the the street corner preachers are phasing out in our generation but the youtube gurus are on the rise yeah, and so we absolutely. see that as a kind of the same thing it's like this I guess what it really boils down to for us as Christians is, especially us who like to teach, um, because believers who don't necessarily want to be um, in front of an audience are not going to be as susceptible to this temptation as people who are more attention seeking by by their personality. You know, like me growing up, I was very attention seeking and a lot of alpha type personalities want to be leaders and and so they kind of put themselves out there like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And and society has need of that type of person, but we're the one, those types of people are the ones who are more susceptible to this temptation. And really at the end of the day, we need to be at a point where we would, 
we're, we're, we're doing it not for the likes or the, the subscribes yeah. or the following. <clears throat> we're doing it because it's, it's our God. We love him. We want to promote his truth. And am I willing to do acts in the kingdom of God, like service in the kingdom of God, in private as well and not proclaim it like not make a post about it like oh you know i brought this uh box of clothes to the homeless on a street corner yeah. you know like putting that on the post that doesn't need to be on a post mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's between yes. me and god right. and and so if the only time i ever read my bible or preach a good sermon is when i'm before an audience then that is bad yes you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i think Another interesting thing to think about is how many of modern pastors in America would stay in it if they totally lost popularity and if if you know if they couldn't be seen like if we came up with a let's say we came up with some kind of uh, practice where the pastor could preach but you would never know who he was because he had to stand behind a veil and, and, oh. it, and it used a, a mask over his voice. Like uh -huh. a, like, so you would never know and you would never be able to give glory to so-and-so for that message. Would so-and-so still volunteer his time to give that message? Is he doing it just for the, the, the essence of the truth of the gospel? Or is he doing it more so for his own vanity and recognition? Yeah. And I think that's what really... I mean, we'll never <laughs> be able to run such an experiment, but but it, it is interesting to ponder. It has a, an integrity element in and of itself, what you say right there, because it's it's like the the integrity of your faith. Like, like will you continue to uh, do what you do out in public if you know that were to happen? You know, will you still do it in private and and relish in it? Um, which I I like. Plus, you know. For me, I feel like it also shows an element of, like, it gives us the possibility of that, you know, showing God gratitude for what he provides for us and thankfulness because, you know, if you are truly grateful and thankful for, you know, your relationship with him, you will practice it by yourself or like, you know, in, in private and, and, it, and it won't really matter. Um, it won't be like necessary for you to do it out in public because you're not gaining anything like you're just gaining recognition from people who are finite right. you know like it's about having you know that relationship with your with your creator with your father and you can have that no matter what like as long as you continue to do that on both sides of the point that's right. like the, the integrity element which you know is a big basis on you know our company and uh, what we believe in so all right mm -hmm. Are we gonna? Yeah, when we, I was a teenager, um, the Glenn Miller Orchestra was gonna mm -hmm. play in the parking lot at the uh, hotel in Lake Lure. And my friend Tim says, "What are you doing?" And I said, uh, "I'm gonna go see the Glenn Miller Orchestra because I like big bands, I like swing." And uh, he said, "He said, let's both go. We'll preach the word while we're there. You know, the way we win some souls." And I said, "Okay, let's do it." So we rode out there on his motorcycle. And uh, we're in this crowded parking lot full of the old folks. Everybody there except us was like in their 70s, 80s, you know, because it's old music. And the band is just starting to play. And there's a great crowd. And Tim says, you know, enjoy your music now because you're fixing to burn in fire. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We didn't win any souls at all. <laughs> wow. But it was the best Glenn Miller concert I've ever been. It's a great example. <laughs> well, all I right. I don't know if that has anything wanna... to do with what we're doing. I, oh, I, I think it absolutely does. It's a great example of, you know, the... Like preaching on the street corner, to, you know. Yeah. There is a time for that, for sure. I mean, there, there, that can take tremendous self denial, and so it really does come down to personalities. Like, right. if if Jane were to go out and be preaching on the street corner, that would be way outside of her personality. She's very much not a teach attention seeking, right? If I were to go out and be preaching on the street corner, um. It could be for the right reasons, 
but it also could be to satisfy my own personal desire for um, attention, you know. So yeah. it does come down to the heart, and sometimes we can deceive ourselves, and so we just need to be praying. When, when there is some need for a public display of our faith, then we really ought to be praying. Like, Lord, I want this to be for you, and I don't want it to be for my own personal vanity. Yeah. Definitely. But more often than not, we don't need to make a public display through our prayer and all that. We can, oh, And through giving to the needy, we can just do it. And the person who we're giving to is obviously going to know, but but we don't need to. I think it should always be for the glory of God. So like, if we, if I leave a big tip on, uh, on a tab at, at uh, you know, a restaurant or something, I will write on there on the note, Jesus is enough. I don't want to just leave a big tip and they think that I'm some nice guy. I'm a just, I'm a generous guy. I want them to know that Jesus is the reason why I am generous. Right. Why I'm capable, even, yeah. sometimes. And when people t- tell me that I'm just this great dude or whatever, which, <laughs> some, it, that, there's, there's plenty of people in the other camp who would say other things about me, but... But when if I do get compliments, I try to give that to the Lord because I know that I am not a good man on my own. I'm a narcissist. Mm-hmm. I'm selfish, like really selfish. And so any act of selflessness or giving that I, that you see out of me, I that is to the glory of the Lord. That's only through his spirit manifesting in me and growing in me. So there is a lot of public interaction, but I try to keep myself humble. Yeah, yeah. You know. I've, I've told you before. I think it, it's worth repeating, though. How uh, when we would go out in public, people would often praise Joey for this fellow that I used to work for. And, uh, he had a very large family and many children, and, and they would say, "Oh, you're a wonderful father. You're a very attentive father." And he said, "I'm a very obedient Christian." That's uh, he said. I would walk out on them in a minute if it was up to me. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and people don't know what to do when they hear a response like that. They're yeah. like, "I'm complimenting you, and you just <laughs> yeah. basically disagreed with me." Right. Yeah. yeah, he you wouldn't know? he wouldn't accept any praise for that at all. Yeah. Um, it was entirely obedience yeah. made him a good father and a good husband. Amen. And, uh, uh, I always respected that a lot. So I really like oh. um, verse seven. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And I, I try very, very hard to take that to heart. Um, because I, I, I honestly believe that he knows my needs better than I do. Um, often I might really urgently desire something sincerely uh, uh, that is not in his plan, it's not his will, it's not uh, um, at all to do with his kingdom, even if I think it might be, you know. Right. So, um, 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 <clears throat> I don't... I try to bear in mind that the most important thing that I can express to him is my gratitude and um, my praise and, 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 and worship and, and uh, I just ask for the basics for protection and, and, and guidance and wisdom. Um, I do ask, I do think it's super essential to pray for God's will to be done, so I'm glad you brought that up. Sean and I were talking about that the other, we've been talking about that actually a lot, um, but we were bringing that up again yesterday, and yeah, I mean, just the willingness to put that phrase in there, if it be your will, Lord, I'm asking for such and such, but like putting that phrase in there, I'm willing to forsake that thing that I think I need or yes. want, and I'm, in, I'm willing to admit that I don't know if it's in his will, and if if it's not in his will, I'm letting go of it and I'm trusting his wisdom for my life. And I do yeah. pray for the willpower and the wisdom and the equip, equipping 
to do his will with the life that I have. So I, I do pray for that. I think intercessory prayer is a different thing. Um, and uh, the scripture shows that God is open to being persuaded through sincerity. And, right, and, yeah, and he is. Um, uh, but I, I just figure he listens to me babble on all day, every day anyway. So I don't have... I, I, I try to be as 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 quiet as possible in my prayer. Um, in my in my in my daily habitual prayer, I try to be very quiet and let him speak to me. Uh, and I also try to shut out as much of the day's nonsense as possible. Um, because I, I find I have so much going on in my brain all the time. Um, even when I'm asleep, it's just rambling, doing all kinds of wild things. Yeah. And if I can get it to be hush for a few minutes and just praise God, um, that's as good as a, it's it's different from but it's as valuable as a night's sleep uh, i believe mm-hmm. it says keeps right me there, from being a panic stir crazy yeah. basket case all the time i mean in uh, verse 8 it says uh your father knows what you need before you ask of him so like i think that does go along with with that uh request uh, you know, you, you don't need to be loud when you pray. You don't need to say a lot of words because he already knows what you need. Like he, your inner, your your spirit is in communion with him already. Uh, so you know. Amen to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, honestly, you can you can almost accidentally be dishonest with your request because if you allow your your human nature to overdo it. You know, like that—that's not who he's in communication with. He's in communication with the shared spirit. So, uh-huh. you know, that in and of itself could be uh, a, a a downfall of of your blessing, or you know, because you know what you're asking for may not be what you need, and so you know maybe it's better not to even ask until you 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 just ask for guidance. And what you need, so that right. your spirit uh, can be in line, like your wants and needs can be in line before you actually pray, so that your prayer is uh, has integrity and has you know truth to it. Maybe. Uh, All right. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, continue with verse nine of uh, the prayer. Okay. Yes. So pray then in this way. Oh, here we go. This is the Lord's prayer. Hey. Pray then in this way, verse nine. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses." Wow, let's pause on that. I know that was a very short section, but I want to point out um, two talking points right away here. First of all, the order of the prayer. We could kind of break this down into sections and sort of um, translate it to modern language for ourselves. I think it starts with acknowledging God as supreme and holy. Okay, that's the first thing that's happening in this prayer is an acknowledgement of God's holiness and his position above us, okay, in heaven. But then the second thing, right, immediately is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so here's another, here's just a boom disclaimer. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe that uh, everything is predestined and happening according to God's predestined will all the time. If it was, why would we be told to pray like this? Why would Jesus even mention that we should pray for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven? 
See, that implies that God does have a predestined will for us, but it might not be coming to pass in a lot of people's individual lives. But if we do pray for his will to be done, then that we start to, we start to align ourselves more with his predestined will, and it's always going to be better for us. Mm-hmm. It's going to be better for society. It's going to be better for communities. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that God is foiled by human corruption or that his, his plans will uh, you know, ultimately come to nothing if we don't, if we don't listen, that, we have, like, like, that the devil has a chance to win in the end. I'm not saying any of that. God is able to constantly turn evil back on itself and create good out of it but he so he he won't be foiled ultimately but he does have um much better strategies that often get neglected by us because we're so busy doing our own will and not praying for his will and so there's a lot of potential that's constantly being left by the wayside um and that's our fault not his so Anyway, so that's the second thing, is your kingdom come. I don't hear talk about the kingdom of God very much in uh, Christendom nowadays, in America especially. I don't hear that much about kingdom-focused Christianity. So I think it's interesting that that is the second priority of Jesus, is to mention that. <clears throat> and then, you know, give us our, our daily bread. That means kind of like, give us our needs, the, the basic needs that we have. And then... Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he goes into this spiel. That's where the prayer ends. But he's like linking those two together, verses 12 and 13 in a sense. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If I'm not willing to forgive, then I'm more at risk, I guess, for being in uh, depravity. And going in, going astray in my mind, going astray in with temptation, and I think in um, Romans one we hear that we Paul uh, says that essentially idolatry is what leads to a depraved mind, and we've kind of already touched on this in conversations past that pride is like the supreme form of idolatry, mm-hmm. like so pride is like the idolization of oneself and. So if idolatry of like other things can lead me into a depraved mind, then pride is going to doubly lead me into a depraved mind. And not forgiving is essentially a form of pride. Yeah. It's this decision. It is. It's, it's being, being your own God. Yeah. I'm my God. My standard of holiness has been, uh, uh, has been insulted and... Who's this scumbag think he is for doing what he did to me? And I will not forgive him. You see? And so being judge, jury, and executioner over another human soul who's depraved and deceived and hopeless. And that's something that we talked about a lot last week was the mercy and wanting other people to be forgiven. And then verse 14 here, this is where it gets real. At verses 14 and 15. And this is where a lot of people, especially in our area of the Bible Belt, do not want to even consider this and the implications of this. But he says, if you forgive other people for their offenses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. And I have to pull this parable out right now where it's not in this, it's not in Matthew 6, but it's coming up later where he is going to say that there's this man who owes this king a huge sum of money, a ridiculous amount of money, and he can't pay it. So the king has him summoned and says, all right, make a payment. And he says, Lord, forgive me. Give me a little more time. He actually, he doesn't say, he doesn't ask for forgiveness. He asks for more time to pay it. And the king has compassion and does forgive the debt. The king does not, um, doesn't say, all right, I'll give you more time. He outright forgives the debt, which is that, that's that symbol of us being forgiven, the debt, our debt being canceled when we come to the father through his son, Jesus, who paid it on our behalf. Okay, but 
Then that servant, as the, par- as the parable continues, that servant goes out and he finds a fellow servant who owes him a, a large sum of money. And it is a large sum of money if you do the math on, on what, these, uh, what these money amounts are. Just to put it in perspective, the, the fellow servant owes this guy about um, a third of a year's worth of wages. Uh-huh. A third of a year's worth of wages. Okay, that's what 100 denarii was back then. And, and, and he, so it's a, it's a legitimate thing to be upset about and he's very upset. But what we don't, un, what we forget is that the servant owed the king, I think it's like 20,000 talents. And depending on whether those are talents of silver or talents of gold, we're talking somewhere in the range of 200,000 years worth of wages. Wow. So that's a tremendous difference there. And so a hundred days of wages is a big deal. Nothing compared to 200,000 years worth of wages. And he, the point of the story is he doesn't forgive the servant. He holds it against him. He refuses to forgive. When the king gets word of it, he re-summons the guy. He re-summons his servant, who he has forgiven. And he says, why did you not forgive your fellow servant when I forgave you of such a large debt? And then he reinstitutes the debt yeah. and delivers him over to torturers. So there you go. There's a mega implication there and I don't see how anybody can read the New Testament and walk away with this idea, this false idea that we can't do anything to forfeit our salvation. It says it very clearly. Here's one thing you can do. Yeah. Don't forgive someone else right. after you've been forgiven. <clears throat> there you go. You, you forfeit your salvation if you don't do this. If you do not forgive. You forfeit your own forgiveness. In and of itself, it's, it's the, you're idolizing that which is part of the resentment by not forgiving because you choosing to hold on to it and make it more prominent in your life. So I think that that right there goes hand in hand with like have no idols before me. So mm-hmm. if you're going to hold that against your brother, uh, you know, you're making it more important than your salvation in your life. Yeah. You know, there's right. an old That's saying yeah. that, that someone cherishes a grudge. Yeah. Uh, it gives you fervor, so, power. You know, it's weird. It's like the, just the having something against someone is a thing of value. Yeah. It, it inspires me. I'll tell you, I, I got robbed by a businessman once. Um, who, well, I, I, I lost a lot of money. I paid for a thing and I didn't receive it. The guy died and his son, who was in business with the guy, knew what was coming to me, but he sold it and kept the money and uh, made a lot of money off of my investment. And I didn't get my stuff back and I didn't get my money. And, and uh, I was really upset with him. He uh, offered me a very small settlement and I refused it because it was insulting. You know, I was out several thousand dollars and uh, <clears throat> I harassed him about it for a long time. I made a lot of efforts, you know, I appealed to his conscience. You know what you did, you know, you need to give me my money. You need to give me something of value, real value, and, and you just wouldn't do it, and then you quit taking my calls. And one day I uh, came across him with a group of his friends. He was with a date, he had a pretty girl, and he was treating them all to drinks, and I uh, accosted him in front of all of them. I said, I want you to know exactly what kind of person this guy is. And I said, and I said, and you're a scumbag. And you also won't stand up and fight me and make me stop saying this about you because you know it's true. And, uh, well, let me tell you, I looked like a complete ass. Everybody (laughs) said, who is this this crazy friend of yours? Can't you make him go away because we don't like him? You know, (laughs) know, all I did was annoy a large table full of people who were having a really good time. He didn't feel bad. He didn't feel convicted. He didn't even feel embarrassed. He was just enjoying the performance I put on. Right? Yeah. And this was years after the fact. So I, I was completely frustrated. I, but I, I had to call I called him on the phone a couple of years later and said, Listen, I, I, I I'm sorry that I did that to you. I apologize, you know. And uh don't worry about the business. There is no business between us, you know. Hmm. Please just accept my apology. And uh he said yeah, whatever, man, and hung up. And I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. 
Yeah. I'm forgiven. what you had to do. Yeah. I am forgiven for that because I don't cherish a grudge against him. I made my apology. I don't care if he accepts it. Yeah. It means yeah. nothing to me if he accepts my apology because he's not a good, he's not a, to, a servant of God. You had to sacrifice that idol that you had yeah. made in your life. Yeah. yeah. One other thing that I'd like to quickly mention, and this goes along the lines of what Nathan and I have been, you know, uh, exposing ourselves to as far as like the videos and the covenant promises. Uh -huh. uh, you know, the, the first opening verses, it says, Our Father who is in heaven, and, uh, you know, we ask his kingdom to come uh, down for us. Uh, you know, that's perfect example and evidence of you know the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant whereas we talked about how the old covenant was like god was had his kingdom on earth but when jesus the time of jesus came that was like re rescinding that old covenant doing away with all the requirements and you know bringing about this new covenant which you know exemplifies the father's kingdom being in heaven no longer being on earth but being in heaven and so that is i feel like was a prime example of that being, you know, uh, true, and you know, he he just very nonchalantly says that he opens his prayer with that, you know, yeah. as as evidence. And I, I thought I would just mention that too because that, just because it's something that we've been talking about recently, but that really brings true to me knowing that, you know, that new covenant in and of itself coming from Jesus too is is truly instated. It is it is happening. It is it is real right now. Right. Uh, so I figured I'd just mention that. Uh, I really, I really appreciate him, uh, you know, op opening the prayer with that. What I mean, there's more we could keep talking about. I could talk about the Lord's prayer for probably just three hours by itself. But we're gonna move on for the sake of time here. I'm gonna continue on to verse 16 now. Now, whenever you fast, do not make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they distort their faces so that they will be noticed by people when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by people, but your father who is in secret, excuse me, but by your father who is in secret and your father who is, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. <clears throat> that goes along with um, what we read earlier about giving to the needy and making these prayers. So here we have an example of fasting. Do not store up for yourselves, this is verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will wow. be also. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, that we need to revisit that, but I'm going to keep reading. Just uh, so, 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 be thinking about what what that passage uh, signifies to us today, right? But I'm going to read on verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad. Your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. All right, let's pause there and then um, talk about some of that. It goes right in line with... Uh the previous uh, conversation he's having, the Sermon on the Mount, um, about, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out so that you will save your entire body from burning in hell, from suffering. Uh, yeah, I think that's just really an, an elaboration on the seriousness of that request because, you know, he's just making it maybe a more like all-encompassing generalized uh, statement of it but he's also relating it to the light, which we are supposed to be, that he you know, talked about uh, afterwards, about being like light of the world and the salt of the earth, and how you know, if these things are present in our life, we are unable to 
serve the calling that we are, we're called to do, being the salt of the earth and, and the light of the world. Yeah, and so, absolutely. You know, I, and, and I love it when Christ makes, or anybody in the Bible, rather, makes a, uh, a statement, and then uh, later on, even like frequent, or uh, recently after, you know, he, he, he says it again, in maybe yeah. like a, a somewhat different way, but it, it, it's pretty much, you know, like I said, it, it's in, it's a elaborating on that previous statement, which, you know, if you had any doubt in your mind prior to, like, what he was referring to or, you know, the, the seriousness of it, like, yeah. I'm pretty sure that you can, you know, leave yeah, knowing yeah. that, like, he was he really meant what he said because he said it twice. And that's uh, it's just like yeah. putting the period on the sentence, like, and that, that just... Putting the exclamation yeah, point because he sentence. doesn't want us to have doubt. He knows how he knows how powerful that like that lack of faith essentially is what doubt is. That, that doubt can be for our salvation and our relationship with him because you cannot have it if you want to have faith. Right. You, have, you know. And um, you're absolutely right. Looking at the patterns of his teaching, it it can be discouraging to think about some of the weird stuff throughout the Bible. The Bible's a very long book written across many different cultures and across many different generations by many different authors spoken in who are speaking many different languages. So so it's a it's a huge document of man's um, interactions with the divine being. But there can be some things in that that seem like a lot of inconsistencies and errors and stuff. And so I, I tell people who are more of the, the critical thinker type, skeptic type I say, look, don't let the, don't let all that stuff bother you too much. Look for the patterns. Base your theology on the patterns, the consistent patterns. Okay, that's what we need to be clinging to and and, and paying attention for. So, like that, just goes in hand with what you were saying. This is a a clear pattern. What he says there in verse twenty two through twenty three that the eye is the lamp of the body, and if you look at things that are the light and your whole body will be filled with light. If you look at things that are dark, then you're going to be filled with darkness. And then you being the light of the world is now dark. How great of a darkness that is. You know, we have to realize our minds are, they have like, there's a window to our mind through our eyes and through our ears. And when we listen to things that are not of the kingdom, and we watch things that are not of the kingdom. And I think this really, for me, it really convicts me with um, media specifically. Now, I mean, you could apply this to like the types of people you're hanging Absolutely. around with and going to bars and stuff like that maybe. Yeah. But like for me, it really just gets even more simple than that, like foundational than that. The yeah. types of movies, that the worldly entertainment, the types of movie and, and music that I consume... So I don't listen to music unless it's by, uh, you know, like a Christian artist personally, even though, even though I'm into like that really hard metal music, I love that, that, that really intense music, but there's plenty of Christian artists that do that style of music. And so that's who I stick with. I stick with that, with those, those artists, because I don't want the world teaching me how to think. I don't want the world influencing my soul. Because you're hearing it regardless of whether you're paying attention to it. That's right. Goes along with like subliminal, uh, subliminal knowledge. Yeah. And uh, you know, for, for me, I mean, this is like really recently uh, relative because, and you know, Nathan and I have have very much talked a lot about you know my my perception and my focus was so dark and like you know I, I mentioned specific examples of like doom scrolling or like getting getting uh you know rabbit trailing down uh the conspiracies and like and just looking at like bad things in the world and so like i started looking at everything bad i wasn't focused i wasn't god positive i wasn't focusing on good things i, I wasn't turning my perception around counteracting something that i might see that was negative with something positive that I tried to take out of it or derive from it. So, you know, it was just continuously, like, pulling me down into this dark pit. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, I was able to humble myself and and, and accept that 
my perception was ultimately my downfall because you know I I refused. It, it was a choice. It wasn't just because like there was bad things in the world. It was because I was choosing to continue to expose myself to all these dark things, all these negative things. And uh, I'll end end this statement with uh, something that uh, is a big part of the recovery scene. And uh, it was uh, a a quote on uh, the door of the room that I stayed in uh, when when I was at uh, the recovery program. I, I won't mention them, but uh, it said, uh, you are the average of the books that you read, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, and the people that you hang out with. So be careful of what you surround yourself with and what you expose yourself to because it will eventually create who you are. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah, that's and that's quote. very true. I mean, just think about it. Like, you know, having that relationship with God is, is in and of itself a really good thing because, like, even there is darkness in the world and whatever, you know, you can light, you can blind, you can, you can, you can cover the shadows with His light that exists in you as long as you choose to put it at the forefront. Like, you, you can't aim a flashlight behind you and travel down a dark path and expect not to trip. So, you gotta, you know, if you have that light focus, that positive focus, that can be really what continues to keep you uh, upright in, in a dark world. And uh, I know that to be true. Like it, un, It's undoubtable in my life, especially since it was just such a recent transition. So I just wanted to like, right. you know, praise Him on that level because it, I, of all people, I, I know that to be complete, completely 100% true and evident in my life. And I'm grateful for the comparison. I am. You know, it, it, it's, it's okay. And that's how I take something that was dark and negative and take something positive from it and, and allow that to fuel my direction right. continually right now. There's, uh, that's awesome. Thank uh, you. There's another way of looking at that that um, means a lot to me is that the light in my eye is... Um, very powerful because it how should I put this I can look at anyone or anything and bless it or curse it you know I can look at, 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 at this person and say you know she's very obedient and faithful and kind and um, blesses the world around her and does her business and you know that's a wonderful admirable person or I can say you know she is a hypocrite and uh, trying to get attention for herself and wants everybody to think that she's good because she's actually secretly nasty you know you see what I mean um, right. and that's that's and talking about I the can, same person yes yes yeah. yes exactly there's a, a sin that the Catholics identify that I, I really take a lot of lessons from and they call it calumny which is observing people and ascribing whatever they do to the most base wicked nature you know yeah. in other words you, you've heard people say you, they'll say uh, you know, oh that guy's a priest because he wants to molest children that's yeah. why he became a priest He's that's calumny you don't know that you see what I mean you could because of the light that's in you or the darkness that's in you causes you to perceive the same thing in a very, very different yeah. way. Wow, that's um, good. That's and insightful. if you go around awesome. perceiving people as wicked and nasty and deceitful, you're going to be absolutely full of darkness. Yeah. yeah. This really goes hand in hand with what Sean was saying about the doomsday search, doom scrolling. Doom scrolling. Yeah. And yeah. I really want to elaborate on what that actually is. That's but so we're all on the same page here. That is like hyper focusing on conspiracy theories and getting on the dark web and you know researching the reptilians. You scroll, that are, you continue, and you endless, just keep scrolling, endless endless, 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 right? And there is so much stuff online. You can indulge in all kinds of weird fantasies. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and sell myself out on this one as well because I'm sort of guilty of a similar. Um, engagement. I don't get on looking at conspiracy theories online, but I, I like to listen to this guy, uh, Matt Walsh, 
I really, he's very funny. He's a very funny commentator. Or at least he appeals to my sense of humor. But it's the same thing. That's all he does is complain about the things that are wrong with society. Yeah. And there's something very true about um, the, the fact that we are very much drawn to negative attention. Or negative news. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Negative news sells. So getting hyped up and angry about political disagreements or, or controversial issues of our of our time, it really draws attention to us and we whether we side on the left or the right or somewhere in the middle, we can't help but get excited and want to consume that just so that we can be angry about it. Yeah. And I think that you guys are both bringing up a good point here that's really in line with what Jesus is saying. Don't do that. Just don't do it. Now, it might be true. There might be some conspiracy theories that are, in fact, true. And if we have the ability to influence for good, then we ought to. If we can expose evil so that there will be justice to come in place of it, then wonderful, let's do that. But if it's things that we can't really control, and then let's just stop. Stop focusing on it and focus on the kingdom instead. You know what I mean? And like, I like to, that's why I'm like not political, or at least I try to refrain from from political involvement. And I encourage other kingdom focused Christians to, 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 to do the same. And I know there's disagreement over this and we don't, we don't have to talk about this, but here's my, my main thing to that is whether Trump wins this new election or um, Biden gets reelected, it makes no difference to my calling. Now, I certainly have a preference in my flesh who wins the election, and I have a preference for what the economy is going to do under one person versus another person, you know, and of course, as a small business owner, especially, I want the economy to do well, so I have a preference for who might win that election, but does it really change my calling if Trump is in office or if Biden's in office? Not if your treasures are in heaven. And that... Let's so yeah, that's what was right before this. Let's talk about that really quick, Jason. Do you have anything to share about that one? Um, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but yeah. rather in heaven. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have to confess, I still have uh, material desires that uh, that frustrate me, um, but uh, I don't have. That's why I was talking about not praying for things because the things I crave are not really the things I need, um, but I can think about them a lot. Um, 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 I have a, a lifelong interest in 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 sports cars, and uh, I've, I've always really, really, really been interested in them, and. Uh, uh, it's still a, an abstract interest. They still are things of, of, of beauty, and the, the people who build them are admirable to me. But um, I can give enormous amounts of my attention to them. And uh, I don't have any money, so I'm not going to have any sports cars. Plus, I, I, I can't see. I'm not fit to drive, hardly. So um, they're, they're not practical to me. But I can think about them and think about them and think about them, which is kind of the same thing as praying for them. Yeah. Um, or idolizing them. And it's idolizing absolutely, them. Yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. And so it's not good for me to own them because I don't have any use for them. And it's not good for me to pray for them because it's vain. Yeah. Um, so that's... It's, it's, and that's thought energy and spirit energy and faith energy that could be spent laying up treasures in heaven. Amen. And the first step is, it's like an addiction. The first step to recovery is admitting you have a problem yes. with idolatry and materialism. Mm. People don't realize how base of an addiction that is for us. Yeah. People say, oh, I'm not addicted to anything. No, you're addicted to something. Yeah. <laughs> you're either sure. you're either addicted to God or you're addicted to the world, uh-huh. one way or another. And 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 my addiction to the world is going to look different than Sean's addiction to the world, and it's going to look different than Jason's addiction to the world. So we need to choose what is feeding us. You know, where is our lifeline hooked up to? 
Where are we? You know what I mean? It's like we all have an umbilical cord that has to get sustenance to s- survive, mm-hmm. to give us, um, to give us life. And a lot of people get their constant energy from the things, or they try to at least, from the things of the world. And there you go. Materialism is one of those things there. And so it is an addiction, but it's an addiction that most of society celebrates because it uh, helps the economy and, uh, and uh, everybody's doing it. So, so nobody, nobody wants to say that it's evil, but in Christ's eyes, it's, totally fa- falling short of the, the standard and we can now we don't need to be materialistic you know what I mean and I think it's just I'm just saying all that to say it's good that you're willing to admit that even if you're not in a place where you're living totally faithless faithfully and, and laying that down at least you're willing to say hey that's a standard that I'm falling short of and there you can start to pray Lord change my mindset change my focus help me be more focused on your kingdom interests instead mm-hmm. of sports cars. A major growth point. And that's, really yeah. Yeah, but if you never admit that it's wrong, if you always make an excuse yeah. to say, oh, it's fine, it's not hurting anybody, then you'll never be cured. The doubt and denial go hand in hand. You know. Doubt and denial, <laughs> yeah, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Love that. I know this, per- I know this very personally. Uh, I, you're not alone in your sports car addiction. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I was addicted to downhill mountain biking, uh-huh. and I got really hurt on a downhill mountain bike one day. Um, and I was a kingdom focused Christian at this point in time, but when the helicopter came to get me off that mountain, and they're you know shooting me up with morphine and everything, and I, I'm I'm just realizing like I've spent so much money on these bikes. And I'm spending so much money going to these parks and staying in a hotel nearby the park and then buying a lift ticket and then riding. And then when I break my bike, I have to repair it. So I'm spending money there. And now, now thousands of dollars are being spent on me with a helicopter ride um, for mountain biking. And I'm, right. I'm not a pro mountain biker. So it's not like I'm, you know, uh, making... I'm not really being productive with this hobby and it's just all about me at the end of the day. I don't, I'm not doing it with a friend. I'm not taking kids mountain biking for a ministry. You know, it's just, it's really just a vain hobby of mine and I loved it. But I realized as a kingdom focused Christian, when there are people dying in the world of base things, like basic things like starvation and lack of water and and, and, and just no shelter and things like that. And I'm, I'm having thousands of dollars spent on a toy as an adult. And there's nothing sinful about mountain biking. But there is something very sinful about a kingdom-focused Christian neglecting his duty. Because it'd be the same thing as if a soldier in the middle of a war zone sees his buddies in need of like combat medic attention. And he just walks right by them. He's just playing on his phone while bullets are whizzing all around and he's, he should be covering his sector or he should be get, treating his buddies who have serious, casual, or serious injuries and, and he's just playing on his phone. He's not focused on the battle. He's neglecting his duty as a soldier. We as Christians have a duty as soldiers of another kingdom and a spiritual war is going on all around us. So anyways, I realized that my obsession with mountain biking had to be given up and so I sold my mountain bike. And then um, the Lord, he repl- th- I'm so thankful for this because my love for adrenaline and adventure didn't just go away. And that was very hard for me to give up that mountain bike. But I prayed that God would, you know, give me something else. And uh, he gave me rock climbing. And so I get into rock climbing and it became another similar thing here where I'm very much enthralled by it. But rock climbing was more, uh, I was able to, make that more of a social engagement with other people. So I, I felt a little bit better about that, but it was still becoming, I was realizing like, man, I'm just wanting to go out to the crag all the time. I'm constantly getting in fights with Jane about going climbing every weekend and let's keep trying harder and harder routes. I'm always putting her under pressure to, to push herself harder and harder. And I want to push myself harder and harder. And so it was becoming an idol again. In fact, I was even starting to go out top rope soloing by myself on these crags and just enjoying myself by myself. So here I am again. I'm veering away from even the social element of it and it's becoming all about me. And so I realize this and I say, God, 
I am going to have to give up rock climbing because it's becoming an idol unless I can somehow devote this to your kingdom. So I prayed about it and I was like, Lord, help me, help me devote my love of climbing and adventure and adrenaline to your kingdom. Otherwise I have to give it up because it's become an idol. And that is how I got into tree climbing. I became an arborist um, through a series of events that came from that. But, um, you know, I became a rock climbing guide at first and then doors started opening in, in the realm of arboriculture. And now I cannot tell you how happy I am now, how fulfilled I am and how I get to, I get to do what I love. And it is very productive and it gets all that raw energy and that pent up excitement. Like I got on it. I want to climb. I get to climb for work all the time. My levels of obsession over rock climbing have gone way down. And so I really do believe that I am in a much healthier place now, not idolizing that stuff. And I'm so thankful for it. But you know, what's interesting is if I go all the way back to that mountain biking example, and I, let's say I refused to give that up mm -hmm. because it's like, yeah, it's kind of an idol to me, but God's probably okay with it because he wants me to be happy. How many people say that? God wants me to be happy. Therefore, what I'm choosing to do is okay. Um, that is a that is a lie. God wants us to be fulfilled in Him. Therefore, what we often want is a distraction, and we need to lay it down. We need to be willing to lay it down. Um, so, so if I hadn't give up mountain biking, if I hadn't given it up, I would have never gotten into rock climbing. I would have probably, and then I would have never become an arborist. Yeah. And who knows where I'd be in life right now? Maybe I'd be doing a job that I really hate that I absolutely hate because I was never going to be good enough to be a pro mountain biker. So I'd probably, I'd have to do something. I'd have to get a job doing something, but it wouldn't be something that I absolutely loved. It wouldn't be nearly as fulfilling. You know what I mean? I gave up something that was precious to me and I went through a period of grief over it. And, and I wasn't, it didn't seem like God was going to fulfill me. And yet I had faith that he was worth it despite my discomfort and my lack of having that in my life and now years later I can look back and say I am fulfilled I am so glad I gave that idol up yeah. because he has truly um, given me some so much more I have much more fulfillment in my life as a result so anyways I hope that's an encouragement it is it is I have a question for you though it is, it, it, there's plenty of good reasons to ride a bicycle and, yeah, and there's of foolish reasons to ride a bicycle, and and and, and yeah, it's, I, I I take a pretty dim view of 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 higher risk um, hobbies hobbies <laughs> that are non productive when yeah. you're over a certain age. You know, like yeah. you, you know, if you're over thirty and you're skating, that's just nuts. You're gonna break your leg for sure. You know, and it's not gonna grow back because you're old. But I, I wonder if, if do you think you could get into bicycles again in a productive way or yeah. is it so no for me i probably could for if i needed to do it for exercise or something like that and it was a social thing yes or would you automatically start doing really I, high risk i would things start like i would start jumping my bike yeah, yeah. i yeah. mean i'm well and i don't think there's anything wrong with doing those jumps either i actually have tremendous respect for like those red bull rampage guys uh -huh. who are going off of 70 foot cliffs with their downhill <laughs> yeah, bikes yeah. i mean that's incredible yeah. but it, it really is a testament to the the power of human will and just I like creativeness the that, uh, um, ride through these ghetto um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay urban, stay urban downhill. That is insane. Yeah, yeah. urban downhill. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, the Red Bull guys. Those are those dudes, they have a productive career in that, and good for them. I mean, praise God, they're using their talent in a productive way. They probably some of them, pro a lot of them, probably don't give glory to God, but um, but hey, I mean, there might be some Christian riders in there who can who no, can give glory to God. A lot of them help the community and try to like fund kids doing similar yeah. things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's big in the skateboarding uh, community too, which I'm very familiar, and, and you as well are very 
very familiar All with. I'm, I mean, I, I still have a board. I There's a local park, and you know, I, and I'd even try to, to help kids there because I've been doing it for a really long time, and uh, I've, I've avoided a lot of injuries over my years, even though I did big, crazy stuff because – I knew I didn't have the money to, like, you know, I didn't want to get hurt forever either. I, I, my fear was kind of healthy in that regard because it, <laughs> it, it helped me yeah. to to look at things in a better, safer way before I just, you know, threw my body down some kind of crazy uh, obstacle. And, uh, you know, I try to encourage children at, at the skate park or young kids at the skate park to do the same thing and show them the right way to do things. Right. And, uh and yeah, I mean, it wasn't because I believed in God and wanted it, you know, at the time. But still, like, you know, I I tried to have a a positive focus and utilize something that is, in fact, just a hobby as you know a teaching tool. And so, like that in and of itself, I think would you know would go hand in hand. And you with the the cars, you know, if you were a mechanic or something like that, you could teach your children or or a, a neighbor or a friend or something like that. You know do this with your vehicle mm-hmm. and you know, there's always God application in everything that we that we have as a hobby as long as we are willing to you know humble ourselves enough to you know to share it with another person you know right. I think that helps us keep things from becoming idols when we open uh, our our enjoyment and our hobby up to to other people around us because then you know it's it can become a pathway to uh, you know uh uh, what is the word? Um, m- mission work, I guess. Yeah, essentially, we, we do need to be careful, though. And and this is a vague thing, and so we can't put a line on it in every respect. But um, I was, you know, I was evangelizing on those park trails a lot because when I would be on the lift going back up the mountain, I would be talking to people, and I had a shirt uh, that the medics cut off of me that said "Jesus saves," and so I was all about witnessing and trying to justify my time as as a big witness endeavor um but that was the reality of it was i love mountain biking and that's why i wanted to do it there were more things i could have been doing with my time better things i could have been doing with my time Mm -hmm. um and i was spending a lot of money on it so i think that christians should try to get farther and farther away from things like worldly hobbies and vacations and things like that. I know that's probably not very popular to hear that, but um, these are things that are wastes of money and wastes of time, and they're feeding the wrong tree, the flesh tree. If we do this a lot, if we feed the flesh tree, then we're going to bear the fruit of the flesh. And the fruit of the flesh is depravity and all kinds of other sinful things. Yeah. Yeah. But if we feed the Spirit, we're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so that's all I'm going to say there. I'm Again, mountain biking and golf, those are not like, mm-hmm. you know, skateboarding and those so, those types of things. Those are not directly sinful activities, but they can, can idols. they are very much idols, yeah. And they're idols to a lot of people who are who would never admit it if they had a scapegoat to simply say, oh yeah, no, I witnessed to my buddies while I'm out golfing, right. you know? So I spend all day <laughs> and all this money doing nothing but talking to one of my friends who's not really interested and it's all going in one ear and out the other, what I say about Jesus, and I'm going to justify that years of waste right. of my money and time because I occasionally share a, a word with my yeah. one of my buddies. True. That's just not going to cut it in Jesus's... When you're standing before the Lord giving an account for how you live your life, I doubt that that'll be sufficient for Him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Because He's going to follow that up with... Where were you when I was hungry? Where were you? You did not feed me. You did not take me in when I was homeless. You did not clothe me when I was naked. You did not um, visit me when I was sick or in prison. And and the goats will say, Lord, when, when were you any of those things? And he says, when you didn't do it to the least of these, my brothers, you didn't do it to me. So uh-huh. that's a really scary thought right there. Yeah. And if we if all we're doing is indulging in hobbies and vacations and, and all that sort of thing while we go to church on Sundays though uh, it's we're, we're neglecting to 
go out and find the lost in the world and the, the poor and the, you know what I mean? Yes. We're, we're out golfing or we're out mountain biking. So I think it's good to mountain bike if you're doing it for health reasons or go skateboarding if you have a, a, a mission to, to reach kids with the gospel and, and that sort of thing. And I'm not, I'm not totally like advocating for the monastic life either. I, I'm not advocating for that. But definitely balance and let's, for me, I'd say, let's be more focused on the kingdom than anything. I think I asked you before, if I remember correctly, uh, his name is uh, uh, Nick Walenda. You know the guy? He's no. A tightrope walker. Mm-hmm. He's a third generation tightrope walker. And uh, um, I saw his grandfather die on television when I was a little kid. Um, he was tightrope walking between two buildings in Cuba or Puerto Rico, yeah, like one or the other, I recall and he fell vaguely. to his death uh, on, on the ABC Wide World of Sports or something like that. And, and so his grandson now, Nick Walenda, is a tightrope walker, very, very, very devout Christian, living the life and 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 full of praise and evangelism full time, and. Um, um, He's very, very focused on on spreading the message of Christ, and um, he tightrope walks for attention. He does, you know, for publicity and to earn a living. He gets paid to do it, and he walks the, the like the Grand Canyon. Um, you know, spans that weird canyon out west, um, and he he praises God the whole time while he's walking. He wears a microphone. So he's like, I'm going to die, maybe, probably, but, you know, I'm going to die praising God, and uh, my body will be destroyed at the bottom of this canyon, and I'll go to heaven, and I'm going to praise Him until I get there. And he just, like, <laughs> it does this amazing, I mean, the high adrenaline of, obviously, um, 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 extremely high-risk activity. Um, I have no idea how effective he's been as an evangelist. Yes, but, uh, definitely it's, an interesting question. But it, oh, so it's a, a remarkable how um, um, focused he is, you know, um, to be so perfectly calm and resolved and happy while at, 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 in extreme danger. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question because it is very, very, very high risk. Um, uh, it's the most risky thing imaginable. Yeah. And it's a publicity stunt. I have a hard it in evangelism. Time, I have a hard time buying it that it's good in God's eyes. I'm not going to make a judgment ultimately because I'm not God, but it does kind of make me think about witches who say they're glorifying God doing witchcraft. I've met witches who have said that. Mm-hmm. They're like, yeah, no, I, I pray to Jesus. And they're engaged in palm reading and, and tarot card yeah. reading and stuff. Yeah. And I've also, um, you know, met prostitutes who are all about their relationship with God and, and they might they might even say that they can uh, evangelize while giving uh, somebody a lap dance or whatever. It's like, there's some things that are just so perverted that we cannot entertain the notion that you're doing this for God. We're just not going to entertain that notion that is so perverted. So, um, and I think this goes back to some stories in the Old Testament too, where Israel is offering their own children in the fire under the guidance of um, King Manasseh and stuff. And, and, you know, Jeremiah says, I did, the, the Lord says, I did not command this, nor did the thought even enter into my mind. Like, here Israel is offering their sons as sacrifices, as burnt sacrifices, and they're, they're saying, well, God, God has led us to do this. God's told us to do this. And God's saying, I never said such a thing. Yeah. Um, so anybody can say that, they're doing whatever for the glory of God or that they're in a good relationship with God as they do whatever. I think we need to be very careful that we are choosing activities that 
are that don't seem so contrary to the patterns of scripture like we've been talking about patterns and so vanity uh publicity stunts just doing extremely reckless things for for no other reason than to say that you did it i have a hard time believing that that could be for god personally i mean and, and again i'm not i'm not going to be the judge but it's there's a lot of things in the bible that like if taking in our modern society too literally can can honestly be adverse to our, our our ministry and our faith because like Paul does say in the New Testament he's like in order to reach the Gentiles I became as the Gentiles yeah but sure, like sure. you know there is a cutoff point <laughs> right in, in in the like specificity of like how literal do you take that uh-huh. like you. <laughs> Right. So there, in there, order to reach drug a, dealers, I became a drug dealer. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I was like, a teenager, that, there was a lot of uh, uh, Christian heavy metal bands. Yeah, yeah. And um, they were evangelists, and in order to to reach the teens of today, they put on a bunch of makeup and did their hair up like women and wore wow, women's clothing, basically. Um, to well, that's going <laughs> that's too far. Just, looks yeah. back oh, then. That's oh, going too far. <laughs> that is going too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they. Uh, it's they, a, they, it's an open ended <laughs> discussion there, and and I think we're going into the weeds now. But it's a it's a really good thought. Every man needs to every man and woman needs to have resolve in their spirit and be praying. If you're in a hobby or whatever that is kind of gray area, if you're in a profession or a hobby that seems to be gray area, then pray. Pray, 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 pray. Pray for God's will to be done in your life. Pray for him to pull you out of the thing that if it's not glorifying him. And just if you're willing to lay that on the altar, then he will reward you for it. Maybe yeah. he won't take it away. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't need to be worried about it. But maybe he will take it away. And if he takes it away, he'll give you fulfillment in something else if you don't lose faith along the way. I think that's the main message that we want to convey and and think on. And every man needs to live, try to live by the convictions that the Spirit gives him and make sure that those convictions are being filtered through the Word of God to to know that they're legitimate convictions. It's a a modern rendition, or like the opportunity of modern rendition of, I think it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Abraham and Isaac, where God asked uh, Abraham to go sacrifice his son to see if he will be willing to go all the way through it. And when he is about to plunge the blade into... In his son. Is that the right, right yeah. people? Yeah, um, Abraham and Isaac. Uh, he, he, God stops him and provides an alternative right mm-hmm. then because Abraham showed true uh, unwavering faith that God, the Lord, would provide. And in the, the last second, you know, he, he was, uh, God saved his son from you know, becoming the sacrifice because Abraham did not question him and was going to go through with his his request. And like I think that's, you know, that is just a really great example of like how things are for us today, you know, with, with the mountain biking or like or the rock climbing. And you know, you were willing to do that and so God provided you an alternative which is also beneficial for the environment too. So yeah. you know, it, it the the old testament stories ring true, live true today. Uh despite being part of the the old covenant but it is a, a resurrection of God's power and and his and his uh willingness to to help us live our lives as long as we're living for him uh amen to that do you do you want to wrap up uh yeah. from uh verse 25 to yeah we're we're almost done with this chapter we really okay, talked right? about that good and so the that yeah. verse 24 is that again no one can serve two masters Either you'll hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. The way they were, they use the word despise a lot. I come to find is more of like, um, just kind of a disregard. Yeah. When it, when they say I despise this thing, it means I disregard it. It doesn't really mean I loathe it. It just means 
I disregard it. So, um, you don't pay attention to it. Don't right. Time not paying it. Exactly. Yeah. And that is so true. And again, that touches on our hobbies and our, our, our mm-hmm. idolatry. Yeah. Well, if we live after our flesh and after materialism, then we are inadvertently taking our gaze off of God and his work, his what he works. might want us to be doing yeah. for society or for the people around us. Right. And we're focusing on just ourselves. All right. We really covered that. Good. That was a good conversation. Moving on. Verse 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And which of you by worrying can add a single day to his life span? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, What are we to eat? Or what are we to drink? Or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's that kingdom reference again. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all the things that you need will be added to you. I have really tried to live by that for the last seven years. And, well, more than actually, probably probably nine years. And, um, yeah, I mean, that has rung true at many different times in my life when I had a lot of uncertainty and I choose to live for the kingdom and I choose to... like pick my my new path like when I got out of the army I had no idea what I was going to do um as a career but I felt convicted to get out of the military as a Christian and so I gave it up I was going to I was going to be a career soldier I mean that was my that was my thing and um I gave that up for the kingdom of God not knowing very uncertain but Man, he has led me now to a place of so much deeper fulfillment than I would have ever had had I stayed in the military. I just tremendous fulfillment now. And um, same thing with the downhill mountain biking, like I already mentioned. Same thing with um, relationships with other uh, women before I, before I met Jane, before I got into a relationship with Jane. Man, if I had married one of those other women, like, golly, I'd be... I'm miserable happy. and 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 ineffective for the kingdom mm-hmm. as because Jane is a really good partner for me to to do the kingdom work with and um she complements my personality with her personality and so on um so those are just a few examples where seeking the kingdom and having that as my main goal in life can just take care of everything God will take care of all the fine details of what I need and what's going to bring me fulfillment and what's going to keep me happy. Like he can provide and he, and he loves to give us good things in his kingdom. We guys, we just got to be willing to let go of the idolatry and the materialism and the lust and the, and the, and the lying and the addiction. You know what I mean? Like just all the, all the things that self serve. Yeah. We give that up. We seek his kingdom. He takes care of us. I'd just like to say one thing in regards to uh, the few verses that he talks about the lilies of the field being clothed. And it, it was not uh, this enough. And, and even Solomon in all his glory, which was given to him by God, wasn't as beautiful as one of these flowers that God created. And it, and it just kind of like hit me all of a sudden. It was like, you know... We find we can seek the we can see the face of God in the beauty of His creation. I've, I've heard people say that before, and that might be a little, you know. But uh, anyways, it just like purely evident to me. It's like God's creation being a visual 
reminder and representation of His power and His glory and, and His and His love for us. Like each little thing in creation shows the fulfillment of His promise to us to provide. So He says, you know, the lilies of the field don't they? They don't spin, thread. They're they're clothed. They have their their you know their mm-hmm. beauty, like, and that's just a flower, you know. We were created in God's image, right? So, I mean, and who are we to doubt or, or to worry about anything when He breathed life into us, you know? And like, all He asks is for uh, us to fulfill His commitment for our, the, for the promise that He gave us, and that that just like really, <laughs> I know, blew my mind. Such a simple, simple representation, but like, how true that is to me. At least, I mean, it just it just hit me right in the face, like. You know, he provides everything for every little one of his creations. Like a tur- tortoise has a shell, and crabs have have their their shell. You know, and uh, right. the, the, the fish of the sea they have their you know their ability to to blend in and hide or whatever. He provides everything that they need to survive. Yeah, and continue we've got to, a curse though that all those creatures don't have. Is we have to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you work. Uh, you do something that you love and enjoy and you do it for the Lord then you never work a day in your life, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to say the skeptic would, um, the skeptic who's reading this, because I, I always have the skeptic in my mind, okay? I'm very much myself. And I myself was an agnostic for a period of time, so um, I like to play that skeptic card on occasion. Um, they would be reading this and saying, well... The lilies of the field and the sparrows don't always get what they need, mm-hmm. because look at uh, look at all the trees that get cut down, <laughs> look at all the um, birds that get shot or hit by cars. <laughs> yep. You know, look at this, look at that, look at this this little turtle that didn't make it off the beach went from its egg and it baked in the sun as it was trying to get to the refuge of the sea. It just didn't make it. But they were all given the same chance, though. <laughs> well, so, some, some weren't, though. I think that's okay to admit that. Here's the thing. The explanation for suffering. Why does God allow this suffering? And you look at humans and children, especially innocent people who haven't really done anything to bring the suffering upon themselves. Um, how do we give an explanation for God providing for them? Right? Uh-huh. Here's the deal. We are His hands and feet, are we not? Yeah. So yeah. it's the potential for His kingdom work that we get to partake in. That's right. The, 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 the world is ripe for the harvest. Uh-huh. And Jesus, Why does God allow this suffering? Why do you allow all this suffering? Exactly. Yeah, yeah He uh, allows it so that we have the potential to become passionate about his kingdom work. Yeah, he can and, appreciate it. And he, and we can, be, exactly, we can appreciate it. And he doesn't like watching people suffer. He would much prefer us to engage. Let's engage. Let's try to redeem more of the world. He showed us how to do it. Let's, let's start doing it. We're like children. Humanity is like a child complaining about suffering is, 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 is kind of, I have this vision of a, of a child taking a toy and smashing it on the ground in, in, in a fit of temper tantrum, and it breaks into all these pieces, and then complaining to the parent, my toy is broken, all right? And then the parent kneels down and starts putting the pieces back together and shows the child, here's how we're going to fix it, but you got to do it with me. And the child is just sitting there saying, no, it's broken, no, I, you fix it, you fix it, and if you don't fix it, then you don't love me. Right? So we say to God, it, there's suffering in the world. This world that we broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We broke it. Our selfishness broke the system and caused all this suffering and fallen nature. And now we demand God fix it. And if he doesn't fix it, then he must either not be powerful enough, or he's not real, or he doesn't love us. Right? Yeah. That is ridiculous. He showed us how to fix it. He got on his knees through his son Jesus and died a servant's death yeah. on our behalf, a, a criminal's death. Yeah. And that showed us how. So we have the model to follow. We can do that. We can start to you know, become good stewards of this world and, and help other people in need. 
And um, yeah, that. Amen. That's it. Say, if he, if he fixed it today, we wouldn't like the repair. You, we we say, where's all the naked dancing ladies? Exactly. We'd fall where's away. The drugs, we'd man? fall away right soon yeah. after. Yeah. Right. So he he's letting this world play itself out so that he can determine who's going to be people of faith and who's going to be people not of faith. So that we, so that for the new kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth, he'll he'll know who the genuine rulers need, uh, you know, who, who his co-heirs will be in that. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. He's weeding people out, separating the wheat from the chaff. Gotta be done. All right. Well, anyways, that was Matthew chapter six. We are right on time with our last one. Now. And uh, yeah. Is- Good man. We That's... went uh, we went an hour and a half again, but yes, it was good. All right. Still not enough time to talk about everything that happened <laughs> to those pastures, but that that's awesome, man. All right.